A Musical Life with flutist Mimi Stillman. At the age of 12, Mimi Stillman was the youngest wind player ever to be accepted for studies at the Curtis Institute of Music with the legendary flutist Julius Baker. Now, Mimi is not only a world-renowned flute soloist, but she is also the founder and artistic director of the Dolce Suono Chamber Music Ensemble, as well as an author, arranger, teacher, and lecturer with a doctoral degree in history. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. Back when I was the director of instrumental accompaniment at the Curtis Institute of Music, I had the good fortune to work with Mimi Stillman, one of the most remarkable young flutists I have ever met. Mimi has gone on to do incredible things as a musical and artistic pioneer, championing new works by living composers, getting her doctoral degree in history from the University of Pennsylvania, and enriching the Philadelphia cultural scene with her remarkable chamber ensemble organization, Dolce Suono. Let's start off by listening to some music by tango master Astor Piazzolla, performed by the Dolce Suono Ensemble. Mimi, welcome to the show. It's been long overdue to have you on. Thank you, Hugh, for having me. I'm so delighted to be joining you. We've known each other ever since you are, were a frisky 12-year-old entering the Curtis Institute of Music, studying under Julius Baker and Jeffrey Kaner. And it's been absolutely remarkable to see how your career has skyrocketed through, since those early years. 
Well, thank you so much, Hugh. Well, well, yes, I was so fortunate to be brought to Curtis to study with Julius Baker by Julie Baker um, when I was 12. And you were with me <laughs> at every lesson and so many of my early, very important concerts. So it's, it's really great to talk about that with you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. So I wanted to focus a little bit. At the age of 12, of course, you were the youngest wind player to have been accepted for study at the Curtis Institute of Music, a remarkable achievement in and of itself. I'm wondering if you'd give us a little bit of background about the years that led up to you being accepted at Curtis. How long had you been playing the flute before entering Curtis? Yes, uh, I started playing flute when I was six. Um, I'm originally from Boston, and my mom uh, is an amateur clarinet player. Um, both my parents are in the foreign language business. They're uh, writers and professors of um, foreign language learning materials, mostly Spanish and French. But I heard so much music in the house. My older brother played clarinet too. And uh, my mom started me on recorder when I was five and taught me how to read music. And within a year, I told my parents that I wanted to play the flute. I had just fallen in love with the sound from being taken to concerts and hearing recordings and hanging out at my brother Alex's youth orchestra rehearsals. So I chose it as my musical voice, but wasn't really necessarily thinking about um, having a career in music. Of course, at that time, I was just a child <laughs> beginning to learn music. <laughs> and who were your first lessons with? Oh, um, believe it or not, it was a little hard at first to, for my mom to find a teacher for me because so many woodwind players, as you know, start in middle school. Um, so that's definitely a few years later, like nine or ten maybe is your traditional middle school band starting time. Um, but luckily I did get a private teacher when I was six who would take me um, by the name of Susan Downey and then later had a really marvelous and important teacher for five years at New England Conservatory Prep School, Daniel Riley, who was, just gave me the most phenomenal grounding in flute playing and music. Um, so yeah, I was lucky to be able to get such an early start. Now that's pretty atypical, as you just mentioned. I, I, I assume it's because of the physical development needed for young players to have the wind, the lung capacity to be able to play those instruments. Is that why most wind players start much later? It, it probably is, yes. And also, I mean, unlike violin, where you can start with uh, a smaller quarter size, eighth, sixteenth size, there's really just a flute that has a curved head joint. Um, but my teacher suggested I should start on a regular size student flute and just grow into it because there can be some balance issues um, when you switch over from curved to regular. Uh, but yes, I think flute in some ways when you're very small is easier because there is a, a student model and it has closed holes so your fingers don't fall through and <laughs> the, the reach isn't as big as, say, clarinet. I think clarinet is tricky, but uh, yeah, my, my brother started clarinet when he was six, actually. My goodness, incredible. So then you somehow caught the attention of famed pedagogue Julius Baker. How did that happen? Well, this was really um, a, an amazing example of serendipity um, in, in the sense that from the time I was very young um, and listening to many, many flute recordings, at one point um, my mother brought home a recording of the legendary Julius Baker. And I apparently said, that is the sound that I want mm. and only listen to his recordings um, from then on. So a few years later, the National Flute Association convention uh, came to my hometown of Boston uh, when I was 11. And I got to meet Julius Baker right before he was to give a demonstration for Yamaha. Um, he was a Yamaha artist for many years and helped Yamaha redesigned their flutes at one point. I became a Yamaha artist later too, but I met him and already it was a dream come true just to meet uh, Julius Baker. But, and, and this was very in keeping with his personality. He just asked me, an 11 year old kid out of the blue, if I know any Mozart. And I said, yes, I know the Mozart concerto in G. And then he asked me to play it right then and there <laughs> at his demonstration. So um, I thought about it for about half a second and said, oh, yes, of course. So so I performed um, before an audience um, for Julius Baker. And then he asked me the, back the next day. And then um, a few months later, he came back to Boston to do an event and asked to perform a duet with me. He invited me to play with him. Wow. 
Yeah, and I'm so lucky that I have a video of that. It's actually on my YouTube channel from when I was 11 playing with Julie Baker. And oh, wow. That's oh. amazing. Well, let's see if we can link that in the show notes. I'm wondering if you don't mind, yes. for those folks who may not be as familiar with the flute and the sound mm -hmm. of the flute, what was it about Julius Baker's sound that attracted you so much? Could you describe his sound? What, was, what made it so special? Yes, and Julius Baker's sound, he was, he was famous for having probably more tone colors or timbre variety in his tone than just about any other flutist and, um, in, in terms of modulating the tone quality and the vibrato, like the pulsation in the sound to suit um, all different types of music, all different types of phrasing, and to be a real master of color on the instrument. So I, I think that's definitely something that attracted to me, this kind of vibrant, glowing sound um, that I loved. And, and of course, he was so well known for his 25 years or so as principal flute of the New York Philharmonic and as a member of the Bach Aria Group reviving the music of Bach in the United States um, and with many other orchestras in it as a major teacher as well. So how many years were you actually studying at Curtis with Mr. Baker and Mr. Kaner? Yes, I was at Curtis for a total of five years um, and got my bachelor's in, of music degree in that time. Um, wow, very early. <laughs> yeah. You were on the fast track. That's amazing. Thank you. And then what happened right after finishing your studies at Curtis? Yeah, um, the very uh, same year that I graduated Curtis, um, I was 17, and uh, Curtis is a very nurturing environment, as you know. I mean, we're, we're both alumni there and have both stayed on <laughs> in, in different ways um, related to Curtis, but I was ready to, to graduate um, and be out in the world. I won Young Concert Artists the same year that I graduated Curtis, and that's a um, starter management career development uh, organization that was founded by Susan Wadsworth based in New York. And so I joined the YCA roster and was performing a lot um, as a soloist, kind of overlapping with my graduation of Curtis. And before that, you had also won the Astral Artists, which is a, I would have, almost a similar organization based in Philadelphia that also helps bridge the gap between music graduates and music professionals by offering them performance idea uh, opportunities as well as career advice. Um, tell us a little bit about your time with Astral. Yes, um, I think it was my third year at Curtis or so um, when I was maybe 15 that um, I won the Astral auditions and was very fortunate to join the roster of this organization um, that was founded by Vera Wilson, who's the director. Um, and they present some really great concerts for their artists. So they presented my official Philadelphia debut recital that we did together, Hugh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, along with a lot of other concerts. So it was wonderful to have some of my early career develop it, developed by Astral, even when I was still a student at Curtis. So it sounds like it's interesting because a lot of, well, I would say, I should say most flute students mm -hmm. aspire to win a position in an orchestra. And from there, then they do their other activities. And it seems like you, from the very beginning, had aspirations not to be in a typical orchestra job. And it sounds like you were very much on the soloist track. I'm wondering how, um, what your thoughts were in terms of your career plans as you were leaving school and as you had these amazing opportunities for solo work as opposed to orchestra. Were you looking at orchestra work at the same time or were you completely focused on just pursuing a solo career? Well, I've always loved playing in orchestra, great training at Curtis and playing um, as a substitute in the Philadelphia Orchestra the, the very first time that my teacher, Jeffrey Kaner, who is principal flute of the Philadelphia Orchestra, brought me in as a substitute uh, next to him. I was 15 and still at Curtis. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> an unforgettable week of Brahms Requiem with maestro Wolfgang Savalish wow. and soloists 
Don Upshaw and Thomas Hansen, and it really doesn't get much greater than that music with that uh, group of musicians. Um, but just so many experiences where I've loved playing in orchestra, very much orchestral training in a sense with not just Julius Baker and Jeffrey Kaner, but in woodwind class at Curtis with Richard Woodhams, who's principal oboe of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and lots of other teachers who come from an orchestral tradition. And, and perhaps I just wasn't thinking so much in those years of choosing what I was going to do, but just getting as much experience of different kinds of performing in repertoire as possible. But I think, yes, I've always loved um, being a soloist, concertos, recitals, and then a chamber musician. And as my career developed, really enjoyed both those opportunities. And then later on, founding my own chamber ensemble, um, as well as designing many of my own projects and programs and let's say recording projects as a soloist, kind of really enjoying the artistic direction and curation of, of my plans. So I, I want to take a pragmatic approach to careers because what, what I try to do when I'm interviewing uh, the guests on the show is to help understand how they did it. How, how are they making, how do you make a living? Because I think one of the biggest challenges that many music students face is that daunting graduation day when they have to figure out, okay, now how do I make a living doing what I love? Uh, you know, were you able to make a full-time living just from the concerts that you were getting through, through young concert artists and whatever followed after that experience? Hmm. Well, I definitely um, built to that. I think um, it's it's really important to be pragmatic as as an artist. I mean, you raise a very important question, and it's something that I think about with my uh, historian hat on as well. Because um, after Curtis, uh, while performing full time, um, I also went and did a master's in history at the University of Pennsylvania, and then loved that so much I continued into the PhD program. So I'm currently an ABD PhD, which is a PhD without the dissertation, all but dissertation. Um, so it, sometimes taking the long view, I think, gee, is it harder for classical musicians today than it was for Handel or Haydn or Mozart or broadening out to other art forms, um, Shakespeare or you know, Sophocles. I mean, the question is, I don't really know, but, um, and I know we've kind of gotten off your very simple question is, did I make a living right after Curtis? And well, I think uh, eventually, yes, I'm, I'm glad to say I, I do make a living as a musician um, with a variety of different endeavors. And it sounds like that's really the track that most musicians have to realistically pursue. It's not one single activity outside of, say, a tenured position at, an, at a university or a full-time position in orchestra, outside of those sort of established organizations, when you're on your own, you really need multiple tracks and multiple projects and multiple sources of revenue. Mm. I, I think so. I mean, for me, I'm very fortunate that I've, I've made a lot of um, artistic decisions in my life and practical ones, too. But, for example, when... When I founded Dolce's One Ensemble, it was really to play chamber music with my friends for my hometown audience in Philadelphia because I was performing a lot on the road and really enjoying um, the solo part of my life, but wanted also to do more chamber music at that time. Um, and there's something really special about playing for new audiences everywhere, meeting new people through your music. It's, it's thrilling. But there's also something really meaningful to me um, about playing in my hometown in Philadelphia because um, the audiences here have really embraced me from the time I was 12 and started at Curtis. And mm -hmm. so I really wanted to play for them um, and play with my friends, many of whom are uh, Curtis grads from different times or different musicians at, at the time uh, when I started Dolce Suono Ensemble in 2005, many based here in Philadelphia. And so I never thought that it would take me 12 years later to being this organization that it is today in, um, in so many different ways. It was just a really fun thing that got, I guess, even more fun, but even more engrossing as well. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about Dolce Suono. This is your organization. As you mentioned, you started this in 2005. That's pretty precocious and remarkable. Is this a nonprofit organization that you founded? It is. And yes, um, pretty early on, we decided we would incorporate and then become a nonprofit so that we'd be able to apply for grants. 
um, and keep developing. Um, so what it is, uh, Dolce Suono Ensemble is a chamber music ensemble. Um, I sometimes compare it to a repertory theater company in that we have a roster of artists. Um, in many different instruments, and we come together on the home series in Philadelphia, uh, expanding and contracting from trio to up to 11 artists we've had, or 13 in some, some pieces, depending on the types of programming. Although the most active chamber ensemble is the trio of flute, cello, piano. Um, and the programming on the Philadelphia Home Series kind of becomes the basis for our touring engagements and a lot of our commissioning of new works and our recording. And um, we play lots of different music. I love the diversity. We play from Baroque through new. And we've just given the world premiere of our 45th piece. Wow. In our season. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the, I mean, I, I was actually interviewing a couple people who have formed their own nonprofits. And I, w I would love if you could share, shed some light into what that process looks like, because it takes certainly a lot of vision. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of paperwork. I'm wondering what, what are the nuts and bolts of putting a not, because it's such an innovative way to, to really form an organization and to take control, artistic control of what you want and to be able to get funding from grants and other um, donation sources. Tell us a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how you incorporated. Absolutely. Well, I've learned so much about the arts business by running an arts organization. And it's definitely been a lot of on the job training that I didn't foresee, but that grew out of this really exciting experience um, as founder and artistic and executive director of Dolce Suono Ensemble to be able to come up with an artistic vision and carry it out. And in some ways, it's a very simple and beautiful thing. Um, for example, we do projects on themes um, and it's our really close team of core artists and board that come up with that, these ideas and hash them out together and then make them happen. And it could take several years between, you know, having the idea for the theme of a program or a project and, and fundraising, planning, doing all the aspects of production and marketing and development and fundraising to, to make it happen. Um, sometimes applying for grants or the grant cycle alone could be maybe 10 months between wow. when you for one and when you find out and at the same time you have um, a lot of planning tasks artistically what artists do we want what commission composers how can we make this happen with this grant or with another grant and there's really a whole strategy aspect which I think it's pretty pretty interesting intellectually I've compared sometimes um, making a big project happen to running a small country so um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure it's less complicated than running a big country, but you know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and and tell us if you don't mind, and just just in terms of rough ratios, um, mm -hmm. because I mean, this is a, a a really interesting way to study other nonprofit mm -hmm. organizations and the challenges they face in terms of bringing in revenue, and especially as we hear from time to time news about how difficult it is for classical music organizations to save, stay viable. What is the rough ratio of revenue in terms of uh, ticket sales, in terms of subscriptions, in terms of grants, or what are the other sources of income that help to, to fund all of Dolce Suono's activities? If you can give me a, a rough picture of what that looks like. Got it. Yes. Um, again, probably without hard percentages, like if we're looking at a pie, um, I think from what I know about the business, uh, Dolce Suono Ensemble is pretty consistent with other small to medium size arts organizations, let's say smaller than a big orchestra or opera company by a lot, in that I think more of our revenue comes from individual. No, I think more comes from grants than individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um and then there's different questions of um, the ecosystem. So based in Philadelphia, um, we have some corporate, but not as much corporate as in other cities whose arts organizations tend to be more corporate mm -hmm. uh, sponsored than, let's say, private foundations. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So that's part of it. And then there's, of course, ticket sales um, and CD sales when we have a release of the ensemble and then touring fees. those, Those are all part of the pie as well. And do you have a staff that you've hired to help you with all of the administration? Because that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it is. I sometimes joke that, yes, if I if I have dark circles, it's because we have concerts and grant deadlines at the same time. But <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it is a, um, a lot of work. We have a very small um, group working on it, but all really impassioned, starting with our board. Um, a little element of it is a is a family business in a way that I get to lure my mother away from writing her books for some of her time as board chairman, working closely together. Um, and then I work with my brother as well, who did his MBA at Wharton, and he's a business person, and he's advises as treasurer of our board, um, as well as really wonderful board members who come from um, the business side or professorial side or lots of different fields in, of expertise, a lot of expertise in nonprofits. Um, And then we have a program assistant or two at any given time working on things. And what's nice is I work very closely with guitarist Gideon Whitehead, who's also our program assistant. So it's really wonderful when artists work on the business aspects, because um, you need to have a team that really understands the vision and shares the passion and make things happen together musically. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for giving us kind of that behind-the-scenes look of what it's like to run an arts organization. Just a final question on that. Um, And with regard to grants, do you have to reapply for the same grants over and over again from year to year, or do they give you multi-year support? Are are there different types of grants? Because it's almost, I've heard from some organizations that just writing, applying for grants can in itself be a full-time position. There's so much work involved. Yes, um, some of them are multi-year, some of them are yearly, um, and you're, you're sometimes limited to some extent by the ones that are in your in your city where you're incorporated and, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a range out there mm. for sure. So I understand with your. Let's go back a little bit to yeah. your degree in history, your your PhD, ABD in history. I'm wondering, were you thinking about teaching full time in a university with that degree? What were you, what are some of the aspirations you have with that degree? I wasn't actually thinking of being a a history professor so much as just wanting to continue growing and learning. Um, Also, maybe having graduated Curtis so young and with my Bachelor of Music when I was 17 and just being out there in the world of performing, I wanted to continue learning. So for me, the master's in history was um, very mind opening with fantastic professors. I really lucked out because my professors at UPenn love music mm. and were very supportive of my um, going off and making music a lot and then catching up with writing and that kind of thing. Um, but I just continued into the PhD program um, because I wanted to continue to learn. Um, I was in the regular history department, but wrote, for example, my MA thesis on the influence of Asian music on the French composer Claude Debussy. And that really typifies the way I, I, I enjoy and feel stimulated by marrying the music and the history together. So a lot of my own projects as a soloist and chamber musician with Dolce Suono Ensemble are informed by history in some way. Mm. You also are very prescient in terms of your involvement with the contemporary music scene. I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about some of the recordings you've made. You have two wonderful CDs, the Odyssey CD, and more recently, the Freedom CD. I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about some tracks from those and explain what the listener can expect to experience with some of the the contemporary compositions. These are works that are brand new, that in uh, several instances, or maybe in all of the instances, you actually invited. When we say commission, that's another way of saying you invite the composer to write for you. So, yes, um, in some of my recent recordings, I have featured uh, premieres or works that have never been recorded before, many of which I have commissioned. Um, And, for example, well... The reason why, I guess, I mean, as a flutist uh, with a great Baroque and classical repertoire, Bach through Mozart, um, and a great repertoire as a soloist and chamber musician of late 19th through 20th century works, unfortunately, 
Beethoven, Brahms, and so many composers did not write flute sonatas or concertos. And so uh, I have a much smaller repertoire um, than the great violin, piano, cello repertoire out there, um, as you know. And as I was mentioning before, Hugh, I think you probably know more flute music <laughs> from the piano than most of us flutists know, just you've played every piece <laughs> and so great. Um, but anyway, so that's a, that's another reason why I love commissioning, not just working with live composers, having the chance to talk to them about what they have in mind, but having the opportunity to expand my own repertoire and the repertoire involving flute. So this is reflected in uh, Odyssey, 11 American premieres for flute and piano that I recorded with Charles Abramovic. Uh, he Fantastic and I, pianist. He's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. And we've been playing together as a duo for about 15 years. Wow. It's a lot of repertoire um, that we've done. And also as a member of Dolce Suono Ensemble, we play a lot in the flute cello piano trio together. Could you talk a little bit about some of the tracks uh, from that Odyssey CD? Yeah, so Odyssey has about two hours of flute music on it because of the 11 premieres, um, wow. most of which I commissioned and, and all of which were not recorded before by a variety of composers, many of whom are also friends and people I've worked closely together, such as David Ludwig, who is my Curtis classmate and is now composition professor and dean at Curtis. Um, and I recorded on here his first flute sonata, which is a really exciting work. <laughs> Another, actually, two of the pieces on Odyssey are somewhat connected. I mean, they don't sound connected, but um, both composers were fellow members of the Young Concert Artist roster. So Mason Bates, who has gone on to a great career, he was in residence at Chicago Symphony and a lot of uh, other high-profile performances, uh, was commissioned by a Young Concert Artist to write Elements for Flute and Piano for me, which you and I premiered together. That's right. It's actually dedicated to you. Isn't that right? It is, yeah. <laughs> Very meaningful, um, as, as many of the pieces that emerge from a collaboration with the composer are. Uh, and Elements is fantastic. What you hear at the beginning, the composer uses some what we call extended techniques, or let's say non-traditional ways of playing flute that uh, signify what some composers of today use. Um, and he takes you through four elements. So at the beginning, the earth movement kind of emerges from primordial space is one way of thinking about it.
So Mimi, I'm wondering, as you are inviting and commissioning composers to write for you, I'm wondering how it works. Do you tell them what you want? Do you say, I want a piece that sounds like this? Or do you simply invite them and let them write whatever they want? How does that collaboration work? I love this question because I think the the conversation that leads to the creation of a new piece of music involves a lot of interesting thinking. Um, for example, the type of commissioning that I do often emerges from a project and often it invites a composer to reflect on another art form or earlier music. Um, for example, with my Dolce Suono Ensemble, a lot of our commissioning is part of um, something that invites the composer um, to fit in, um, but be very creative with aspects of the canon. For example, we had a project of a two-year project, Mahler 100 Schoenberg 60, uh, which celebrated the anniversaries of the deaths of Mahler and Schoenberg. It was a 2011 centennial of Gustav Mahler's death and 60th anniversary of Arnold Schoenberg's death. So two major composers um, related in some way um, that have been extremely fertile for the imagination of later composers. And so we commissioned six new works. Um, including by the Pulitzer Prize winners Shulamit Ron, uh, Stephen Stuckey, uh, Stephen Mackey, David Ludwig Fongman, and Stratis Minakaki. So that's pretty large scale in terms of six very different composers reflecting on different aspects of the same theme, um, but always having a conversation with those composers, which I find very stimulating, about what is it that resonates with them about the project. So, for example, also on the Odyssey CD is Benjamin C.S. Boyle's Sonata Cantilena. Um, he was also a fellow YCA artist, and uh, I commissioned him to reflect on Samuel Barber for the Centennial Project, uh, honoring the great American composer um, that I did with Dolce Suono Ensemble in 2010. And you kind of, if you have something in mind, you want to think about what composer has a musical voice that would really in some way connect with this, with this framework of ideas, but also a project in which you don't want to ever really limit the composer's creativity at all. So after kind of talking to them about the theme, um, I give them a lot of recordings or try to play, play for the composer live a lot so that they know my playing and that of my, my fellow artists. And then kind of take it away from there after working out the basic things like how long is the piece and uh, who is it going to be written for in terms of is it flute piano or flute cello piano and some of those other basic questions. And another question I have is how do you select the composers you work with? Obviously some of them are, are your friends and others are colleagues through professional association. I'm wondering do you also have a a different selection process? I, I guess I'm asking this question on behalf of composers. I know sometimes composers struggle to to make those connections, to get their music heard. And sometimes uh, I'll have composers reach out and just send me scores. And to be honest, uh, I, <laughs> unless I'm being paid, I, I don't have the best incentive to just simply read music. I, 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 I'm feeling very guilty for, for confessing this, but I get a pile of music and it can be very difficult to find the time or find the decision mechanism to decide, okay, I'm going to commit the time and energy to learn such and such a piece. What are some of the factors that help you decide which composers to approach? Yes, that's a great question. I'm sure you you are sent many pieces by composers all the time, um, as I am, and I try to get to know them and get through them. I think um, it's hard also because if you're a commissioner of a new piece and you've invested a lot of you know, time and effort to make that a reality, you want to invest more time and effort to give multiple performances and shepherd that piece through its, let's say, New York and Washington and Philadelphia premieres, maybe take it on tour and then record it. So it's a little harder to get to get to the um, pieces that have come unsolicited from composers um, in that same way. However, um, yes, I think just in general, if I'm looking to commission someone, there, there are a lot of composers that I've been fortunate to work with or to get to know their music, or if I'm invited to a festival and I play someone's music and I really like it, I'll think, oh, let me file that away for a possible later commission, right? Um, but sometimes we have projects 
um, where we specifically want to seek out new voices or work with emerging composers. And one example is my ensemble had a young composers competition in 2013 as part of a year long celebration of the 150th anniversary of Claude Debussy. Uh, Debussy pops up in my musical life a lot because <laughs> I love his, I'm a flutist and I love his music so much and I've done my MA thesis on him and, and arranged his songs and so never need excuses to do things based on Debussy. And so, yeah, I understand you also did a fascinating project where you played one of Debussy's works for solo flute called Syrinx and this was interesting because you played, you, you recorded yourself playing this piece every single day in a different location for a whole year. Tell us a little bit about that project. Oh, yes. Um, thanks, Hugh. I'm glad you mentioned it was my Syrinx journey, my personal tribute to the great French composer Claude Debussy on his 150th birthday. So I made videos of this piece, Syrinx. It's a two and a half minute masterpiece, a real staple of the flute repertoire um, every day for the entire year. So it was 366 days in a row, starting and ending on Debussy's August 22nd birthday uh, from wherever I was at the time. So throughout the U.S., wh wherever I was giving concerts, sometimes from a concert, sometimes not, or in Italy or in Israel uh, that year, sometimes in my living room, and I would um, sometimes bring in different colleagues to do something with me or improvisation or focus on Debussy and art or Debussy and other composers and bring in some other music. So it was really, really exciting. A lot of people thought I wouldn't make it throughout the whole year <laughs> <laughs> every day. But, you know, I actually really missed it afterwards. So I still do bonus series videos. Sometimes. So here's, here's a question. I have actually a two part question. Number one, did you get sick of playing that piece every single day for a whole year? And then the second part to that question is, did your interpretation of it change after having played it so much? You know, it's it's so fascinating because it was the only time I've ever done something like that. You know, make a recording of the same piece every day for a year. I never got sick of it. I mean, sometimes it'd be a little hard logistically to, to make it happen and post it if I was traveling or something or whatever. But um, it, it became such a beautiful part of every day. Um, and that kind of connects to the other part of the question about the interpretation. I, I think... Um, having such an intensive experience with such a great piece, um, yes, I think that the interpretation changed to some extent a little bit every day um, and throughout the year. Uh, it made me reflect on just the greatness of Debussy's music and perhaps this idea that great music, once you work very hard to try to you know do it properly or let's say do do what the composer wanted or plumb the depths of all the symbols on the page, then it gives you back some freedom or some openness for growth and change with it. And I definitely felt that throughout the project. If you don't mind, I'm going to jump backwards again because I, I still want to see yeah. if I can be on the composer side a little bit. I'm an yeah. unknown composer. Nobody knows me. What advice would you give to a composer who wants to connect with you? And I mean, if just sending you scores is probably not going to do it, but what would be your advice to a young or even an established composer who wants you to play his music, wants to be recognized? What would you advise them to do? Yes, well, I know that you and I receive um, pieces from composers all the time, sometimes composers we know or don't know well or don't know at all. And it's a really difficult way, I think, of building um, a composer's career in the sense that, yes, I will try to listen or look through every score that I receive. But because I'm so active commissioning new works, it's really the works that I've commissioned that I have to devote my time and energy and resources to bringing out and giving multiple performances and recording and taking on tour. So it's really hard to get to the ones that you know I didn't commission, let's say, or have a hand in, in um, helping make happen. However, I'm constantly listening to composers' music to expand my world of who I know um, and what their style is like so that, let's say, if my ensemble is doing a project like our Mahler-Schoenberg project, 
when we commission works reflecting on those composers or let's say a project based on um, another idea. Uh, we did a WC project, as I mentioned, or Samuel Barber Centennial project, so that I feel that I know beyond just my closest circle of composer friends, what sort of musical voice by a composer might be really suited to that project. Hmm. Um, and so, so what's your what's your advice? Yeah, my advice actually for for young composers when they ask me um, is really get to know the people in your orbit and at your school. So when composers are in school at a music school, let's say they they have all these performers around them, and I think you you want to give works to them um, to perform because you can learn a lot by by hearing your colleagues play your music, and it's really your friends or the performers around you who are going to take your music out to their concerts, and both as a learning and as a career building experience. So that's that's something I say to composers. I often give. Um, talks and performance presentations to composition departments at universities like U Arizona or recently Cornell University or at Curtis Summerfest where I'm on faculty and I love that experience of talking to young composers about their creative ideas um, but also trying to answer questions about about how to get their music out there in the world so I think that's one really important thing um, kind of build your network of performers that you know and also have a really good website with tracks that people can listen to because there are people who go to the web first of course you know to listen and and see who's out there in terms of uh, composers mm, thank you so much for that practical advice it really I'm sure a lot of composers are going to really appreciate um, that, that and it's really isn't it about relationships as you mentioned it's the importance of building a network of friends and a community of fans yeah. and uh, just getting your website in order so that it's easy to find you and sample your artistic output yes. oh and sorry and Actually, another thing I realized, they're, they're, the nice thing is there seem to be more and more opportunities for young composers and ensembles of new music started by young performers as well. Um, and also there, there are lots of good competitions out there for composition. In fact, my Dolce Suono Ensemble is having our second young composers com competition um, this season. Uh, offered in memory of our very close friend who passed away, Stephen Stuckey. Mm, 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 wonderful. I, I just again, just this is a question. Just I'm pulling out of my hat. What about a comp competition for older composers? I'm wondering if anybody would ever think of that. I know the Van Cliburn has a fascinating competition for amateur pianists who don't have to be, you know, 15, 20 years old. These are people who can be. You know, just amateurs, but they could be 30, 40 years old. I don't think there's even an age limit. I'm wondering if there might be some merit in having a competition for any composer of any age limit. Would you think there'd be any merit in that? Oh, I think it's a fantastic idea. And, you know, it's it's funny. We joke about this as as a uh, former prodigy performer. Uh, performers are very, very young and composers get to be young for longer because um, <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a longer period where people describe a composer as emerging. So even uh, many young composers competitions might be 30 and under, but there may well be some that are that are not age specific. And that would be wonderful. Yes. You know, you, you, with the compositional um, development, it would seem that because a lifetime of experience would lend a different type of composer, just as, as an author, you know, for somebody who's writing a book when they're when they're 20, they're certainly going to have a different authorship when they are in their 40s, 50s or 60s or later. And they're going to write a completely different type of book uh, that reflects their life experiences. I'm just, uh, uh, you know, we, we tend this, I think in, in classical music, there tends to be an obsession with youth, you know, mm -hmm. the young prodigies. And then, well, then what? We grow up, <laughs> we're not, when we're not prodigies anymore, but we still have something to offer, and it'd be, offer. And, uh, it'd be nice to hear of organizations that maybe take a second look at those folks who uh, are a little more seasoned in their life and still have want something wonderful to offer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, I would think so. I like to think that we keep getting better, right, Hugh? <laughs> well, I, uh, well, I hope. <laughs> so, Mimi, I'd like to close off with just some questions in terms of what's next for you. You've accomplished so much with your Dolce Suono ensemble, with your solo work. You're an author, you've arranged music, you have public, you've actually had several of your arrangements published through Theodore Presser, just an incredible uh, list of amazing 
variety of activity. You know, it's not just one thing. You're not just a performer. You're a lecturer. You're a teacher. You are uh, an author. You are uh, an arts director. What's next in your musical and life journey? Oh, well, I, I do really relish the, the diversity of my artistic life, which keeps me learning and growing and having exciting contacts with new colleagues as well as audiences. Um, immediate next, um, I just had an experience, which is going to come up again, with uh, performing the Nielsen Concerto. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the Carl Nielsen concerto. Yeah. This is a kind of a staple for flute students and flute performers. And yet at the same time, I don't think a lot of people outside of the classical music flute world really know this piece or maybe have never even heard it before. Yes, I know. It, it's so interesting as, as a wind player, especially we have certain pieces that are so important to us, but are not really mainstream. But um, the Carl Nielsen Flute Concerto is such a staple. It's by the Danish composer. Um, he wrote it in the 1920s. And as a solo flutist, I don't play it as much as I play my Mozart concertos, but I, I really um, feel a very deep connection to this work. I find it just very emotionally moving. Um, and also kind of a nice connection through my teacher, Julius Baker, because there's a famous recording that he did of the piece with the New York Philharmonic conducted by Leonard Bernstein. And the, the, the lore is that he did it in one take. Wow. <laughs> so, so just um, a few weeks ago when I performed a piece with Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra, um, there was, I, I just really so much felt the sound of Julius Baker in my ear and a little mm. bit his presence and some of his remarks about the piece in performing it, which was quite meaningful. So that's something that just happened. But uh, next couple things coming up, um, I'm uh, excited to be performing this spring, both Mozart concertos with different orchestras, working on my own cadenzas for them, which is really an exciting sort of historically informed experience. And, um, a, and a cadenza for folks who don't know is a it's it, there's a tradition when you play a work with the orchestra that there's a space towards the end of the one of the move one or any of the movements where the soloists can improvise and, and and just take do their own take of what the composer wrote and, and and I guess the only word for that is improvise. It's an improvisation based on the themes that you just you would would be hearing in that piece. And so uh, some famous composers have written out cadenzas or improvisations and and but uh, the more daring of us like you will create your own. So that's pretty exciting. Exactly. Thank you, Hugh. I'm actually um, looking forward to uh, improvising more. I do most of my improvising in the Latin ah. uh, music and a little bit of Jewish music as well um, in that way. And it's kind of um, excited to do it in a Mozart um, style. And so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to a series of recitals um, and residencies at uh, the University of Virginia, Virginia Tech for the Minnesota um, Flute Association um, for Yamaha. I'm a Yamaha performing artist. I'm teaching master classes for them at Music for All Festival 
and a variety of performances with Dolce Suono Ensemble um, in Philadelphia and on the road are among some of the things coming up along with some more recording. Mimi, it sounds like a thrilling, exciting, and varied life. Thank you so much for taking the time to give us a peek into what it's like to be a, 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 a soloist, an artist, and a pioneer in the music world. Well, thank you, Hugh. As you know, um, you were such an important part of much of my early musical life Aww. and certainly an artist who goes way beyond fantastic piano playing <laughs> into so many other areas. So I can't wait for our continued collaboration. Oh, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Hugh. For links to Mimi's websites, as well as some videos of her performing a duet with Julius Baker and her innovative Syrinx project, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to get the latest updates on future episodes. You can also subscribe to A Musical Life through iTunes or with your favorite podcast playing app and get new episodes automatically downloaded onto your smartphone, tablet, or computer. If you enjoy these stories about making music and the things that move our souls, please tell a friend about this show and consider posting a short review on iTunes at amusicallife.com forward slash review. Thank you for your support. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.